The reason why we are so much interested in taking derivatives in this lecture is that of course all machine nearly all machine learning algorithms in the end solve an optimization problem. You have a loss function, you have a space of functions, you want to pick the best function in this large class of functions uh, to describe your data at hand and typically you specify a loss function and maybe a regularizer and then you want to find the best function which means you for example might want to minimize the loss. So in the end we need to solve a minimization problem and to find the minimum of a function we typically look at the gradient um, and then we need to define and once we know about the gradient we also need to find out whether we are at a minimum, a maximum or a saddle point. And this is what I briefly want to outline in this lecture. So consider, um, it's, it's a definition, consider a function f that goes from rn to r. In the context of machine learning, rn are, like, are your input points, maybe the feature by, by which you describe your, uh, the objects that you're currently interested in, that you want to classify, for example, molecules or customers or whatever you like. Um, so these are objects described in rn and the output in the end is going to be, for example, a loss function or so a real number, and assume this function is differentiable. So in machine learning it's very often the case that the natural loss functions you might want to come up with are not differentiable. For example, in classification, the natural loss function is asking did I classify it right or wrong? It's a 0-1 function, a discrete function that is very annoyingly difficult uh, to optimize. So what we do instead is we pick um, uh, we pick alternative loss functions uh, that maybe have similar properties but are at least continuous and ideally also differentiable otherwise we can't really um, explain or we can't really write down an optimization algorithm and then we optimize the surrogate loss function and hope or can maybe also prove that by optimizing the surrogate loss function we also optimize the true loss function we're interested in. So this is why I started with saying assume this function is differentiable um, and now, uh, what is a critical point? If the gradient of f at a point is zero, then we call f uh, we call x a critical point. Uh, then we call x a critical point. And now there are different types of critical points. And now I want to describe these um, types. So we say f has a local optimum at a point x0. Sorry, I didn't want to say local optimum but local minimum because I wanted to be a bit more explicit. A local minimum at x0 if there exists. So what is a local minimum? Intuitively, it's a place where the function has a local dip. So once I move away from this local dip, the function is going to increase. So it means there exists at least a tiny region in the space where this point, well, such that the function value at this point x0 is uh, the smallest one. So if there exists some epsilon larger than 0, such that uh, for all x which are in the ball of radius epsilon around this point x0, we have that the function at x is greater or equal than the function f at x0. And I want to maybe make one drawing. Um, so this is uh, a function that we might want to consider and this for example is a local optimum, a local minimum, sorry local minimum. Okay. Now, um, local minima are nice, but often we are even interested in global minima. Or, sorry, um, this was first of all the local minima, and now I also want to say what is a strict local minimum. Um, uh, so F has a strict local minimum. at x0, if there exists an epsilon and so on, such that, um, I, I don't write this, uh, for all x in this ball 
of radius epsilon around x0, f of x is strictly larger than f of x0. So what is the difference? Uh, a local optimum uh, or a local minimum could be, it could be also a flat function, which is constant, then all these points would be local optimal because at least the function doesn't get smaller if we, if we, decree, uh, if we go away from x0. But typically we're interested in a strict local optimum and what I've plotted here is also a strict local minimum. Maybe I plot this here, this is a strict uh, local minimum. Okay. And now, of course, you can define the local maximum analogously. I'm not going to write this down. Um, the maximum is uh, uh, f has a local maximum, respectively a strict local maximum. Uh, if uh, you can fill out it yourself, now we just have to turn around the order. Um, so for, or maybe I just write it down. For all x in the ball, we have that f of x is smaller, or depending whether you want to be strict, smaller or equal. Uh, in the strict case, it's it is strictly smaller, and in the other case, it is um, smaller or equal uh, than f of x zero. I think that's all clear. Um, and now, the very important point is that in higher dimensional spaces, there exist situations where, and also in fact in, um, in the one dimensional case, there exist um, uh, points where you might have a local, where, you, where the gradient might vanish, but you neither have a local maximum nor a local minimum, and these points are called saddle points. Um, so if f is differentiable and x0 is a critical point, so meaning the gradient vanishes, but in this critical, critical point we have neither a minimum or a maximum, a local, then we call it a saddle point. Differentiable and x0 is a critical point that is neither a local minimum nor a local maximum, we call it a saddle point. And how can this happen? So maybe I just uh, underline the important things here. Uh, so, so the thing you might want to have in mind in the one-dimensional case a so saddle point would be something like uh, is that a good drawing? <laughs> so um, the point here, this guy x zero, is a saddle point. It so the derivative at this at this point is zero. If you walk to the left side, the function decreases. If you walk to the right side, the function increases. So it's neither a maximum nor a minimum, so it is a saddle point. Um, but the name comes, in fact, from the multidimensional case. Maybe I need to make a bit more space here uh, and move it a bit closer here. So this is the one-dimensional scenario. And the multidimensional, I try to get a good drawing. Let's see whether it's going to work out. So. You have a function of two variables, um, and it looks maybe like this. It's some kind of, uh, that's where the name comes from, saddle. So here you see the contour lines of this function, um, and the function goes in this way, and here in the, in the back, uh, it's sort of, that's in the back, oh, sorry, here. And now this point that is in the middle here, uh, this guy, that is now a saddle point because if you look in one direction, the function, it is a local minimum, that's where the saddle goes down, and in this other direction, it is a local maximum. So maybe I can try to, to plot it, but it's, it's going to be hard. Maybe I just leave it like this. I think the intuition is clear. In one direction you have it a minimum, and in the other direction it's a maximum. And this is where the name saddle point comes from. 
Um, what else? Um, oh, I didn't even define what is a global optimum. Maybe, well, I just do it here. So F has a global optimum, a global minimum at x0 if, and now the difference is, so the global minimum is some, something where the function cannot get better anywhere else in the space. Um, so it's the best, the smallest local optimum that exists in some way. If uh, for all x in your space you have f of x is greater or equal to f of x0. And then you can have a strict global optimum if this equality is strict at this inequality and you can also look, of course look at global maximum and strict global maximum. So um, and again once more what is the difference? So here we have a function and this is um, here, here we have the global optimum, global minimum and here we have a local minimum. And of course, a similar picture you can draw it for a multidimensional case if you like. Okay, I think so far that's all pretty clear and the intuition is also clear. <coughs> but what I want to um, outline now is how are these things related? How can we see <coughs> from the derivatives which type we have? And if you remember in the one-dimensional case, um, you can already see it from the derivatives. Because in the one-dimensional case, um, um, Maybe I just make a drawing. Um, intuition one dimension. In, so so the, maybe I write down first the question: How can we see uh, which type we have? So and the intuition is in the one-dimensional case. We can see it um, from t looking at the first and second derivative. So there are three situations that we might want to distinguish. So uh, a local minimum, what do we have? We have that the, the first derivative um, at this point is, uh, uh, the first derivative needs to be zero and the second derivative at x um, needs to be I always get mix that up, but the derivative is here, the slope increases, so the second derivative grows. So the second derivative here needs to be larger than zero at this particular point, at x0, if this is the point x0. And now if you look at the local maximum at x0, then we again have f prime of x is zero and we know the second derivative of x is smaller than zero. Now the other situation that we might have, this kind of saddle point, um, it looks like this. So here what we have in the one-dimensional case is f prime of x is zero and the second derivative at x is also zero. So the curvature, so um, because what you see is the like the curvature of the function is the second derivative, so if we're in this area before the critical point, it gets flatter and flatter, and then it's zero, and then it starts to get higher again. So the second derivative is also zero. Okay, so this is the intuition in one in in the case of one-dimensional um, intuition in R. And now we want to look at um, a theorem that states sort of what are the equivalent notions for a higher di higher dimensional spaces. And now. We need to consider, I mean, the first derivative that's still clear, that's the gradient, and as the second derivative, we now need to look at the Hessian matrix. Theorem. Um, so consider a function f that goes from Rn to R and assume that f is uh, twice continuously differentiable. And now there are a couple of statements. <coughs> Um, so assume also that x0 is a critical point uh, so that means of course that the gradient of f at x0 um, is 0 
Then we have the following statement. So now we are in the situation that we have seen above. So you want to find an, an optimum of a function. You first of all try to identify a point where the gradient is zero. And now you have to decide what the, what the situation, in which situation you are. Is it a maximum, uh, a minimum, or an optimum, uh, or a settled point? So the first statement I want to make is if x0 is a local minimum, and I write in parentheses always the same, the equivalent statement for maximum. So if we have a local minimum, then the Hessian uh, h f at x0 is positive definite, uh, semi-definite, positive semi-definite. And in the case of the maximum, we have negative semi-definite, negative semi-definite. Now let us briefly digest that the Hessian is a matrix. Well, in fact, the Hessian is a function that uh, that um, goes from uh, that for each point uh, that contains all these partial derivatives. So it's a matrix n times n. And now we can evaluate these guys at a certain point. And also at a certain point, this is just a matrix of numbers. And now we can ask, is this matrix positive, definite, negative, definite, or indefinite? And the statement is, if we are at a local optimum, then this Hessian is positive semi-definite, meaning that the eigenvalues are all either zero or larger than zero. And observe also, we are in a, in a situation, so the assumption we made is that the function is twice differentiable, twice continuously differentiable. So in this case, we know that we can exchange the order of taking the partial derivatives. So in this case, the Hessian is symmetric, which is good because it already means that we can take, uh, we can, can um, uh, find a basis consisting of eigenvectors. And once we did that, um, then we can look at the eigenvectors and see whether they're all either zero or larger than zero. And then um, we see it's positive semi-definite, or maybe if you're in a maximum, then it would be negative semi-definite. So that's the first statement. Um, and maybe I just give that a number. It looks a bit funny. So the second statement I want to make is um, for positive. What, what do we know for positive definite? So here we just have positive semi-definite. And now I want to say what happens for positive definite matrices. And now the statement is if h f of x0 is positive definite, In the strict sense, now not semi-definite, but po uh, strictly positive definite or negative definite. Then x0 is a strict local uh, minimum or maximum. So if you found if you find your critical point and the Hessian is positive definite, you know you're in a strict local minimum. If your Hessian is posit negative definite, you know you're in a strict local maximum. And now the, the third case that might happen is um, that your matrix is indefinite and then it's a settled point. So if HF at x0 is indefinite, so what does it mean to be indefinite? It's neither positive semi-definite nor negative semi-definite. It means it has eigenvalues which are positive and negative. And observe again, uh, the matrix is symmetric, so we can find eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. Um, so so there is, the eigenvalues have mixed signs. <coughs> um, then x0 is a subtle point. If it's indefinite, then x0 is a saddle point. This is typically not the point that you might want to find if you, so if you solve an optimization problem, at least in the machine learning context, typically you might want to find a local minimum or a maximum, depend but most uh, optimization problems are formulated as minimization problems. Um, and now the, the main importance of that theorem is you first look at your, I mean, you use a gradient descent to come to, to find a place where your function has gradient zero. 
And then you look at the Hessian matrix to decide what kind of minimum or maximum or subtle point you have.